Welcome everybody here this morning. Thank you so much for uh, being willing to take time, uh, spend some time with us. My name is Julia Thompson. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director uh, for the City of Cape Girardeau. And we had an opportunity when Jan Neitzer, who is the Executive Director for the Missouri uh, Park and Recreation Association, she said, Julia, I'm coming through town. Um, what do you think about us getting together? Can we get some folks together? I said, Absolutely. It's just right after the biggest day that we have practically the whole life year, Spaghetti Day. Um, but we were able to pull together um, a really nice panel for a discussion today about why parks build community and how parks build community. And I can't think of a better example uh, than right here in Cape Girardeau. We were talking about just, we're just small enough and we're just large enough that we've got this microcosm here in southeast Missouri, which I think makes us unique and parks play a really strong role in um, helping build community. So let me introduce our panel, and really pleased to be able to have Dr. Tom Holman uh, with us. He's a professor at Southeast uh, Missouri State University. Tell a little bit about yourself, Tom. Uh, I'm just a regular kid, so. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I enjoy teaching students at the university. We got a, a recreation major, Dr. Uh, Beverly Evans and I are both faculty there in the in the uh, Health, Human, Performance, Recreation Department, and um, we got a great little gig going there and try to get our students involved in the community. And you look around and take a take a look around uh, this area and throughout uh, Missouri and, and the country, really. And, and a lot of our graduates are out in the trenches doing the uh, a lot of this kind of stuff, and it's just a, a real joy to see that happen. And, so. Well, and Tom, I know that you're a big outdoor adventure enthusiast, and he takes his kids out on a lot of uh, camping and paddling trips, and he's also um, a hunter, and I guess you, the, the deer might have got the worst end of it, but... Yeah, you know. I, I didn't lip off at the bar. The old lady didn't, the old lady didn't get mad at me. I just I scoped myself. The scope kicked back hit me in the nose. So. But I got a deer, and that's fresh back straps are well worth anything. There you go, Tom. Well, thank you so much for being here, and I'm really proud to introduce uh, my city manager, uh, Scott Myers, extremely supportive of Parks and Recreation. Scott, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I uh, am a uh, trained engineer. I actually went to engineering school at the University of Missouri Rolla back then. That was our s and um, and so I, I came in public service in, in a little bit of a different way. Uh, I remember when I was uh, at college, I saw a poster that said, uh, uh, civil engineering is a people-serving profession, and that really uh, stuck with me that uh, we're really here to use uh, whatever skills we have to serve people. And so I'm passionate about public service. I've got 30-some uh, years of public service uh, with uh, the highway department. Uh, well, uh, 22 plus with the highway department. I worked at the university for uh, about uh, almost five years, I guess four plus years. And then, um, and then I've been with the city for uh, five plus years. So um, I, you know, I believe in I believe in people. I believe that people can do great things, whether it be uh, uh, athletically or or through uh, through personal discipline. But uh, people do great things, and in employment, uh, they do when they're challenged. And uh, our Parks and Rec department brings that out in people. They bring it out in, within our ranks. We see them do great things, but also they help citizens do great things uh, through the programs. And I think that that is a is something that carries over not only in, in this part of the city, but uh, throughout the city. So love to see that happen and love what we're doing. Scott, thank you so much. And it's always a pleasure to introduce our Executive Director for our Chamber of Commerce, John Maynard. John. Briefly. Uh, also public service background, my first post-collegiate job, I was a cop. So I did that for a little while, then went into private business, and then ended up at the Chamber, and I've been there for 21 years now. As it relates to what we're talking about here today, I grew up in our parks. I played in our parks when I had kids. I've coached in our parks for years and years and years and years. And now I use our parks and our rec system as a sales tool with what I do at the Chamber. I know we're going to talk about that a lot more later on, but I am glad to be here. Oh, we're so grateful. Thanks for saying. I know you're busy. Everybody's got busy schedules. Uh, no busier maybe than Jan. Jan, our executive director of our professional association of parks and recreation. She's up in Jeff City. Jan, welcome to uh, Cape Girardeau in Southeast Missouri. It's a pleasure. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I grew up in Columbia, Missouri, and um, 
graduated from Mizzou in Parks and Recreation uh, back in the dark ages. Um, <laughs> left the state for 26 years, various places and adventures, came back to Columbia about seven years ago, and a perfect example of being in the right place at the right time happened to find out about a position with the State Association, and I've been there now seven years. Uh, my predecessor was there 31 years, the first and only executive director they'd ever had. Um, we are the only state association that represents Parks and Recreation um, on several levels. Uh, we are a 501c3, and our tax exempt purpose is education. So our goal is to enhance our professionals' performance by providing them with the most quality education and training that they can get so that they can then serve their communities. And um, I also do legislative work in Jefferson City. Um, we also house our Hall of Fame there, if you'd ever like to come and see us. We have the uh, honor of having our own building there in Jefferson City. Great meeting site, if you'd ever like to come and hang out there, if you're over at the Capitol, uh, let me know. We have about a thousand members representing all corners of the state. And um, as Julia mentioned, um, I am embarrassed to say that I had never been here. Um, Julia has been a great addition to our um, association, and I'm just tickled to be here, and I, I timed it around spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> we almost put it in for honor. It's so busy. Jen, thank you so much. And I'd love to introduce to you Chuck Martin. He is uh, kind of the front face of Cape Girardeau. Um, he literally uh, welcomes you uh, with wonderful staff. He's the executive director of our Convention and Visitors Bureau. Chuck, tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, um, I had the wonderful opportunity in my high school years of living in the state of Virginia. Um, at that point in time, Virginia was running a great campaign called Virginia's for Lovers. Um, what's ironic about that is that was back in the early 70s. They have now come back to that campaign again. But that love of travel, I grew up with a family that loved to travel all over, had a chance to just see a number of states. And uh, the importance of getting away, recharging, rejuvenating, was really kind of instilled in me at an early age. Took a circuitous route to get there, but I've had the pleasure of working under John Maynard um, at the chamber, uh, which our CBB basically operates under uh, for the last 12 years, hard to believe, starting my 13th year now. Um, kind of, I work more on the external, whereas most of the folks, um, at least from Scott and John's position, um, focus on serving the citizens in Cape. Um, our job at the Convention and Visitors Bureau is to kind of reach out and, and uh, make those external relationships and draw people in. Uh, currently, I have the pleasure of serving on the Missouri Travel Council's Board of Directors, and for the next two years, I'm serving as the president of the Missouri Association of Convention and Visitors Bureaus. But uh, Cape is a wonderful place. Um, I'll tell you what, it's a dream job to be able to sell a community like this, and uh, just happy to be here. You can see why Chuck is the CBB director. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure to introduce, last but not least, because the youth are our future, of course. We have a student from Southeast Missouri State and a recreation uh, major, Joe Stark. Joe, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yep, I'm a uh, student at Dr. Tom's and Beverly Evans. Um, I'm in the, I'm in the uh, outdoor recreation program. Um, really, I was super undecided on what major to pursue. It came time to transfer from, from uh, Shawnee Community College until I met with uh, Dr. Tom, and you know he started kind of throwing out some ideas of what what was out there. And uh, I've always been into scuba diving, hiking, backpacking, that kind of stuff. So that really stuck with me, and uh, that's what I'm pursuing right now. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you to all of our audience members. We have a lot of, even though the camera won't pick, pick you up, I um, appreciate my staff uh, getting up after working a really, really long, exciting day. I'm just going to get They're all here, uh, almost all smiling. Um, thank you so much for coming. And then we have some other folks from out of town, some folks from the university. I'm um, really proud to have Dan Yesner here. He's on our Parks and Foundation, and Bev Evans um, on our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. So this is a very relaxed, uh, type forum. Um, we, I'm hoping that the audience will have some questions and some of the things that our panel talks about will spur some ideas for you to ask. So feel comfortable uh, being engaged in this process. We'll probably spend maybe the next 30 minutes um, just kind of coming up with some, some provocative questions of the day about 
parks and recreation and some of our trends. And so please feel free to raise your hand um, if you want to have some follow-up questions. But we're going to start off with Jan telling us a little bit about um, kind of where she's at with Missouri Parks and Recreation uh, from a statewide view. And also, we just got back from our uh, National Congress in Charlotte, North Carolina. Maybe some words about um, what you experienced at our Congress. Um, well, first of all, um, we'll get the nice thing out of the way because we're laid back, but I certainly don't want, do want to be invited back. So, um, first of all, I'll thank, uh, thank you for, for putting this together. This is, this is such an honor um, to have everyone uh, be invited or voluntold or whatever you were to be here um, to hear about things that are kind of vague and, and maybe nebulous, um, but perhaps something that one of us uh, might say might resonate with you who are veterans and maybe looking for the energy to get up and go again when you could be fishing or hunting. And for those students who are wondering, have I made the right decision? Is this really what I want to do? Am I going to go into a field where I want to do things that have always been fun for me and then end up with dealing with people who um, are, don't appreciate me and I'm not having any fun at all? We want you to be validated with the choice that you've made because I know that it's made all the difference in my career and I, I imagine that Julie would agree and some other longtime employees. So thank you for taking the time to, to think that we might be uh, worth listening to, or at least me. I'm sure you are, always. <laughs> those of, especially those of you who are elected. Um, so for a long time, and I've been around long enough that I grew up in a, in a house and a, and a neighbor and a neighborhood and a community where things were pretty black and white. You knew what was expected of you. You knew what would happen if you didn't do it. You pre knew pretty much what would happen if you did fulfill expectations. And, and as long as that was predictable, things were pretty calm. And these days, there's less and less black and white, more and more gray, more and more situational ethics, more and more what works for you doesn't work for me. And it's difficult sometimes to arrive at that balance where you think that you know what you want, what you're meant to be, your purpose, whatever the case might be. And everyone has that question from time to time. So it's, it, it is that balance. It's that black, the, the black and white it is now, it's now pros and cons and pluses and minuses and ups and downs and, and good news and bad news, which of course reminds me of the bad, good news, bad news story of the, the uh, doctor who uh, calls his patient and says, um, good morning, uh, I'm really sorry, but I've got some I've got some bad news. And the patient says, well, doctor, what is it? And he says, well, I'm sorry, but you've only got 24 hours to live. And the patient says, oh, my gosh, that, that's just terrible. I mean, so what could be worse than that? And he said, well, I meant to call you yesterday. So there's good news and bad news all the time. So the good news that Cape Girardeau has had the privilege of, of taking part in is uh, the 1995 passage of House Bill 88. And most of you uh, were not around when that happened. But um, how, Representative Jerry Maguire was a good friend of NPRA, but only because of what he did. He was not a particularly at, um, enthusiastic park advocate. He was a you know, general supporter, but really didn't have a, a great history in campaigning or anything for this being one of his causes. But for 10 years, literally, MPRA, Missouri Park and Recreation Association, along with some other partners, including the Missouri Parks Association, affiliate of the state parks, and Conservation Federation, some of you may be familiar with that very powerful um, organization, had been working literally uh, the whole time, 10 years, to try to find um, a Congress, a person in the General Assembly who would carry a bill that would provide dedicated funding for parks and recreation. And it, did, it took all that time. Um, McGuire agreed to do so. It was finally passed in 1995. And as you know, it, w it provided enabling legislation so that cities and counties could vote themselves up to a half cent sales tax for parks and stormwater control. And it could be, as you, and I'm sure you all know this, but just really quickly, it is, it's up to a half cent. It can be all parks, it can be all stormwater, or it can be a mixture. There's very specific ballot language, um, how it's administered, who controls the tax. Um, it's all in the state statutes, um, and it's you know it's a cure for insomnia if you've ever ever liked to look it up. <laughs> but 
that literally, there are over 150 cities and counties in Missouri that have passed a Parks and Stormwater Sales Tax. And it has brought in literally over $20 billion to our communities. And um, you're all since 2007. I don't know what your dollar figure is. Um, Julia has some, had some good figures last night, which I, of course, can't recall. But, um, but it's significant. And it, um, it has enabled us to grow by leaps and bounds um, to the point of facilities and programs, but primarily sites and site development, land purchases and development, to serve our communities uh, in such a way that we even had to create a um, facility design and management school for 10 years because we had so many people coming from all over the world, literally, to come and tour these facilities to say, how did you do this? How did you fund it? How do you manage it? How do you staff it? Where do you get your supplies? Developing your budget, uh, architecture, design, um, all of those things. So um, it has literally changed the environment, change the landscape here in Missouri. So congratulations. I understand you passed it in 2007, which is like 2008. Oh my. That's okay. That is such a wonderful case study because in 2008, you know, it happened. It's like all of a sudden nobody's got money and nobody's building anything. And that actually was the year we ended the facility design and management school because there were no new projects because everyone was, you know, tightening up. Um, so, so tightly. So, and, and 2008, of course, was when a lot of things happened. Um, so, the good news is we have that. The bad news is that for those who have a sunset, um, either for their entire uh, tax or a portion of it, every time that vote is coming back, it's stressful. Um, and you wonder, you know, is this going to, and, and any time you think it's going to be easy, don't even, don't even go there. And Becky Stidham, who's with me here from the City of Columbia, a wonderful uh, testimony. Um, Columbia, Becky, share for just a second, and I know you can't get her on the camera, but about the, um, the ballot issues in Columbia, the sales tax that was so easy. Everybody loved you. Oh, well, we uh, passed our first one in the year 2000, and it was because the community wanted to preserve this beautiful piece of land right in the center of Columbia that was under threat of development. It had been owned by a college, and the college um, needed money, and uh, it was a, a Stevens College, and they wanted um, the city to buy the land um, and preserve it, um, but there was no funding for it. So that's what prompted the passing of our first park sales tax. So it was $8 million to buy this property. So we passed it in 2000, and all you need is a simple majority, right? So we passed it at 54 percent, which is not a landslide, but it's you know, and it, everybody wanted to preserve this property, but people, you know, you know, don't want sales tax, you know, the, the business people. And then in 2005, it, uh, an eight cent of it goes up for renewal, and that's what funds our capital improvement programs. So 2005, we passed it at 53 percent. And then two years, and we always sat really pretty. You know, everybody loved Parks and Rec. We had a park supporting mayor who made the Hall of Fame. He was so supporting. Well, the mayor retires, the economy tanks, the city manager had changed over, and all of a sudden, when money was tight, everybody was going, why are we funding parks when we need police and fire? So we were two years out from our ballot, and we thought, we are not going to pass them. So we really worked really hard um, uh, educating our community on the value of parks and recreation, how we help the community with the environment, how we bring in economic development, how we um, um, help with crime by keeping kids engaged. And we spent two years really trying to teach people what the value is. And then we were able to pass it during that bad economic time and after a lot of negative sentiments. <laughs> And without our park supporting mayor, and uh, after people got it and really realized we weren't just fun, but we actually do things that are the important things, um, we passed it um, at 64%, which was higher than it had ever been in the past. So we really thought once people get it, what the value is of parks and recreation, that um, um, they see how valuable you are. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, and again, I, I'm a face of the association, but having stories from people who are feet on the ground is really valuable. 
Um, in theory, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. Okay. So, so, so that's the good news. The bad news is, again, every time there's a sunset, there's stress about um, if that funding is going to continue. Another good news is that many communities, much like Cape Girardeau, have very um, supportive elected officials and managers. Um, the bad news is sometimes those people don't stick around. Um, they retire, they find other things to do, um, they move on, and you never know from one election to the next if the, if the tenor of the discussion is going to change. And they're pressured from all sides but by other departments who have demands and good stories and sincere requests. And that's a difficult position to be in. Um, the good news is Parks and Rec folks are reliable. We're lovers, not fighters. We'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. We'll do more with less. We'll work longer. We'll work harder. We didn't go in here to make a fortune. Unfortunately, that gets taken advantage of, and it's very easy to get burned out at that as well. And I will tell you, and I'll, I'll let the students speak for themselves, most young people and the students, that's not the life they want. They want to know that they're appreciated in a tangible way for everything that they do, and they have choices of what to do with their time. And they're not quite as silly as they are about us, you know, who, oh, I'll do it, I know. But, so, we need to get better at telling our story, and not telling it in a defensive, in a defensive way, but in a realistic way, make the case, much the way the other departments do. So, so we're reliable, but the bad news is, you know what they say, it's another edge, you can down if you want. If you're not at the table, they're on the menu. So we need to make sure that we were represented, that our voice was there, and that we're not just going to take the leftovers. And there's a reason for that. It's not just protecting our own jobs or our team's jobs. It's protecting what we bring to the community. So the good news is we're now paying attention, really paying attention. We are measuring, we are counting, and then we are translating that into meaningful information so that the community recognizes exactly what, um, what we bring. Um, the reason that we happen to be in this area is that we um, have a program called Did You Know Friends of the Park? And it is a, a, a systematic approach to demonstrating the, the measurable value of parks and recreation and communicating that so the professionals understand it and then our community understands it. So that we're not the ones defending ourselves. Our community members get it. They understand it. They can articulate it. And they're the ones who become our advocates when push comes to shove or things get tough. So we're now paying attention. The bad news is knowing it ourselves isn't enough. Um, we, the research shows that the residents love Parks and Rec, but they can't really say why. They, they say, oh, well, it makes me feel good. My kids have fun. It's something to do. They get outdoors, fresh air, I like it, the dog loves it, whatever the case might be. But when it comes down to making those tough decisions, like the people at this table have to do, it's sometimes it's just not that easy. I need more than that. I need more than that. The firefighters are bringing me kittens up in trees. I need more than that. So um, we're, we're getting better at that ourselves. The good news is things are changing. As professionals, the bad news is, and this goes back to the students, do the professionals of the future understand that? Um, one of the stories that we tell in our training as a catalyst for the Did You Know is that one of our members is an adjunct professor at another university, and I won't say which one, it's not this one. And he had a, he had a class of 50 <coughs> juniors and seniors. These are not freshmen just coming in, discovering a major, oh, I think this looks like fun. These are people who have pretty much committed to, to sacrifice, their, they're going to trade their whole career for this field. And he said, I want you to tell me a value Parks and Recreation. Tell me a value, a real value. You know, like, what's it worth? And he says, I've got cash money. And he was going to give a dollar to every student who could name. And they, they didn't have to have numbers, but just some kind of value. <coughs> Not one student could name a tangible value of Parks and Recreation. And that is depressing. So we set about to change that. And so, and we're not the only ones. We're not so arrogant to think this first, we're the first ones to ever do this. But we are the first ones to put this in a systematic way so that citizens understand them become the advocate. So, a forum like this, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. So important. I've already got some ideas as to how we can implement this in some other ways. I'll be calling you and probably all of you too. You know, Aldo Leopold said, I am glad I shall never be free without wild country to be free in. Because of what good is, a blank, is, a, is freedom without a blank spot on the map? We are protecting something that is 
intrinsic, it's visceral. We all get it. But you've got to be able to articulate it so that when that sunset comes along, when that person's choosing a major, when you're looking to pass a law that may affect your, the future of your community or your children or your schools, you have to make the case in the way that the listeners need it made. And maybe it's a story about a child who's 88% less likely to drown because they have had swimming lessons. Or maybe it's because crime prevention goes down 30% if there is something for these youth to do between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, which is when most of them get in trouble. Those types of things resonate with different audiences. We need to be better at that. And uh, that's, what, that's what our association is really committed to these days. And at NRPA, almost every time slot, there was something about this initiative. So this is not going away. And um, again, thanks for accommodating. Thanks for your patience. And hope you're serving lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jan, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when Jan speaks. I've heard her speak a number of times now. She always has really great stories. They're always very poignant. You can tell she's extremely passionate and good at her job, but also what she didn't mention is that as Missourians, we can be very, very proud because we have a conservation ethic in Missouri. Um, we have uh, dedicated uh, funds that go to our Missouri Department of Conservation and state parks. Um, that has enabled us to have one of the best conservation departments in the country. They are nationally recognized uh, for the work that they do. Large portions of Missouri, uh, precious spaces have been preserved in that, uh, preserved with that funding. Also, we were just named last year the best trails state in the country. We can be very, very proud of our state parks and our state trails. Um, I know many of you have probably hiked or biked on them, but please take advantage of all of Missouri's assets. Um, we do a very, very good job at that. I'm just very proud. So I'm going to go ahead and move over to Dr. Holman. And Tom, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in trends in, uh, from an uh, uh, educator's standpoint. Oh gosh, that's a great question. I was just going to go back to your, you were talking about a tangible deal, $1.1 billion generated in hunting and fishing in this state alone, $1.1 billion. I just saw the stat in the latest Missouri Conservationist magazine. So it's quite a, quite a big deal. So anyway, yeah, uh, as far as um, some of the trends and issues that we're kind of seeing going on with, with um, I, and I think you've had on here kind of a student perspective or kind of what we're seeing just in general in this area and nationally, I think, I, you know, I think there's quite a bit to be said about uh, uh, some of the things we're seeing, but, you know, our, our, there's a, a bit of a student shift. I mean, it's kind of the same, but I mean, we're seeing uh, different opportunities, different things for them to be able to do, but throughout the, just sort of the parks and rec industry, there's a lot of things and some of it was just mentioned by you all, but, uh, you know, we're seeing a big shift in demographics and, you know, things are changing. We've got uh, lots of changes in demographics. The baby boomers are uh, a, a thing we're looking at. Uh, we're working with different populations now. Students are having to be a little bit more aware of those kinds of things. It's not just sort of the standard, uh, you know, sort of typical hometown folks participating in Parks and Rec now. And, um, you know, I think students are starting to see that. We're starting to see a big uh, then on nature, uh, nature awareness, uh, Richard Louv coined the term a few years ago, Nature Deficit Disorder, in his book, Last Child in the Woods, and he's written a second book now about the nature principle, talking about how we all need nature. So there's this big nature movement going on now, and I, you know, you just mentioned our conservation department, but in our nature center right here, and it's just, uh, I think we're seeing really that starting to grow, and how we can all benefit from nature, and so our students are starting to get plugged into, plugged into that kind of stuff and see Parks and, and rec departments getting more kind of plugged into that sort of stuff, that outdoor recreation and the nature experiences and some collaborative things there. Uh, That's kind of a difficult um, dichotomy that we have going on because technology is consuming everyone and we see a lot of um, uh, young people consumed with the machines that mm -hmm. um, they've got uh, kind of glued into. So I think that's one of the reasons that that's become such an issue is how are we going to develop our conservation leaders of the future if they're either on-site or inside or in, in their, on their devices all day? And well, I've, I've worked with some other faculty in the, at the university to develop a course that, a university studies course, and we 
it's called nature literacy, but anybody can take it, but they need a UI 400 level class. But it's a seminar, senior seminar style, and we sit around the circle and we read Richard Lou's book, uh, The Nature Principle. So if you get a chance to get get your hands on that, but it's a great, they lead us in a chapter discussion and they have to go out and do some nature experiences and stuff, but it's just this kind of thing about, wow, uh, kind of that perspective of, there's nothing wrong with the technology, but we need to balance that out. So anyway, I think uh, that's that's kind of moving along. And then we're seeing a real big shift, I think, in, in the whole sport, kind of sport management, sport industry, sport kind of stuff, which is also, I mean, they're cousins with rec, and so it's this weird... Uh, interaction that we have in our, you know, our rec majors, we kind of go up and down and we're, uh, we got up some numbers and woo, but the sport management, it's interesting, we have, we, we recently, our sport management program recently got accredited, and so it's like, hey, we're like cousins, we're kin, you know, we shouldn't be fighting against each other, we kind of, there's give and take there, I think, but it's interesting because I think people like, Hey, I want sport management, I want sport management, I want sport management, but you can do a lot of those similar things, I think, with the recreation kind of thing, and it's just trying to get people to work together and say, hey, let's do this together and kind of build on each other and sort of do that, but it's, a, it's just an interesting trend, and a lot of programs and universities are seeing these big spikes in their rec program, I mean, in their sport management programs, and their rec majors are kind of uh, dwindling out, and we've seen a huge shift in the therapeutic recreation side of things, and a lot of that's starting to shift and change faces. It's funny, uh, go in and go to St. Francis uh, or go to uh, uh, Southeast and go to their go to their occupational therapy things and go to their uh, physical therapy sessions and stuff. And what do you see going on? Rec therapy. Folks are doing rec therapy. They're doing recreational therapy kind of things. But it's under this different guise, and so I think therapeutic rec has kind of taken a hit there uh, in a lot of ways. And we're seeing a lot of programs across the university starting to drop theirs, and we've unfortunately kind of had to drop ours. And we had a, a rec therapy program for a while, and the numbers just weren't there. And we lost some key faculty that were kind of keeping the pulling the cart there and making it go, and it sort of dwindled out and, and fizzled out, but it's just an interesting thing, and I think, but it's a national trend that we're seeing, and it's just shifted images, shifted faces, and now you see it as occupational therapy, uh, uh, physical therapy, and obviously there's more than physical therapy than just that, but they're using those same recreational tools, rec therapy kind of tools to do the same sorts of things. To get well, those and I out. think too, it seems to be, um, like you said, a cycle that a lot of times when you learn a little bit in all areas of the profession, it really makes you a lot more versatile because sometimes you have to go where the jobs are. Right. Um, a lot of times, if, even if you might be in outdoor recreation, you might start off in municipal government and public recreation and apply those skills um, and help them build their program in outdoor rec um, until you find the job maybe that satisfies. Um, your true passion. I know uh, Scott, your son, is out in Colorado, and he's going to school, and also, um, is he teaching snowboarding? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's skiing mostly, <laughs> and mountain biking, uh, but, uh, but it's a passion that he has, and, and that's what took him to Colorado, is, is mountain biking, and now he has his, his uh, passion for skiing, but it's, a, it, it, you know, it's real central. To his life is is the recreation portion of his life, and so it's, it's very different than an engineer approach of life. Joe, from a from a student perspective, what do you hear the students talking about um, as just kind of the buzz, the undercurrent of uh, the profession and the classes that they take? Um, just uh, from my experience, it's a uh, People don't, or incoming students don't really know a whole about, a lot about the recreation area um, because it like the community college and high school level, um, they're being kind of forced towards uh, engineering, mathematics, and science. So until they get into the doors of the departments um, at universities like uh, recreation and, uh, and other sport-minded um, areas, they don't know the things that are available. Um, many times I was told that it's impossible to have a salary to raise a family in the recreation department. So uh, it was a major risk when I decided just to jump in and, and figure out what happens. Um, as far as in my classes, I see that uh, 
Some students are still real unsure on which direction they're going with it, but others are, you know, full-fledged. This is what they want to do. They have a, you know, a set career in mind. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, kind of wishy-washy in areas. But I think, as a community, um, a lot of these uncertainties come from underappreciation for the recreation area. I mean, we all have hobbies that fall under recreation. We just don't coin them by the right names. So. Uh, just a real uncertainty from that. Well, thanks, Joan. I think we all realize that if you can uh, work your passion, you know, if you love what you do, um, and then you can work in that area, how much of a blessing is that? And I think that's been one of my greatest um, joys in life, and, and grateful that I was able to work in the parks and recreation profession because every day I come to work loving what I do. So even though there might be some gray areas, it will. Um, it will figure itself out uh, through time. And you can make a living in parks and recreation. Um, a lot of times people don't take you seriously. I remember one of the very first things when I said, uh, somebody asked me what my major was, I was an undergrad at Florida State, and I said parks and recreation. They're like, what do you do? Just have fun all day? I mean, that's the, that is the type of stigma sometimes that we're dealing with. Is yeah, what's wrong with that? I'd love to um, turn it back over to our uh, economic impact uh, portion of um, the business of our business. And I'd like to hear a little bit from Chuck Martin because sports is big business, isn't it? And so we've uh, kind of grown in that area over a number of years. Um, so Chuck, tell us a little bit about uh, tourism and the impact of sports and parks um, for Cape Girardeau in our area. Sure. Uh, I would echo uh, Jan's comments, thank you for putting this together, and it is a pleasure to be here. You all have talked about wilderness, a love for the great outdoors. I felt like covering my heart, red, white, and blue, and I'm the guy that now gets to change the color to green. Um, so I, I just would note that certainly there is an economic impact that does come from parks. Um, some of the working relationships that we have at the Convention and Visitors Bureau at best can be challenging. Um, I would just tell you that the working relationship that we have with our parks department here in the city is really second to none. Um, all of the folks that we work with are just commensurate professionals, um, dedicated, work long hours, and really go the extra mile in making sure that the groups that come here have a quality experience that is not only going to be rewarding for them that first time, but certainly is going to probably lead to them being a second, third, and additional time. So kudos to Cape Girardeau Park and Recreation Department. You guys do good work. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> she did not pay me to say that. Um, but, but there are several different avenues that I could have come from, but I, I just wanted to kind of touch upon the amateur sports. Um, but let me just kind of preface that by saying, if you came here recently for the garage sale, if you drove the parking lot, there were an abundance of Illinois plates in that parking lot. So some of the things that I'm not going to touch upon that our Parks and Recreation Department do um, definitely yields money as well. But when you talk about some of the things from the Convention and Visitors Bureau standpoint, um, U.S. Fast Pitch Association, National Softball Association, Babe Ruth State Tournaments, swimming events at the bubble, um, Special Olympics, both basketball and outdoor games, all of these have a direct economic impact on the community. Mm. And without going through some laborious formula, just let me tell you that we do have an economic impact formula that we take a look at each of these events, how many people are coming, um, we basically break out hotel occupancy, food, gasoline, other miscellaneous expenditures, and we're able to really kind of determine how much money these different events are bringing into the community. Suffice it to say that a typical tournament that is going to come to town with about 30 to 50 teams, um, you are talking right in the neighborhood of $100,000 in direct economic impact to the community. You do 10 of those events a year and you're talking about more than a million dollars in economic uh, impact. So for us, 
Um, you know, I live a block and a half from Kappa Hall Park. Um, I have had the opportunity to personally enjoy going down there and enjoying fall's colors, um, enjoying the geese uh, swimming around on Kappa Hall Lagoon. Um, we've had picnics there, um, so personally, I've had the opportunity to take advantage of the park. But I'll tell you, for us, from a professional standpoint, there is no better feeling than going by Shawnee Sports Complex and seeing the parking lot packed with cars, the fields packed with teams playing, and knowing that that is a direct economic impact to our, to, to our hoteliers, um, to our restaurants, to uh, convenience stores, to a variety of different people in the community. So uh, we have a great relationship with our Parks and Rec, and anytime you're considering future measures, I would definitely encourage you as well to keep in mind the fact that um, it really isn't just recreation, it just isn't all of the wonderful things that they do to enhance community life, which they do, but it is also the fact that it is a department that definitely brings money into the coffers for the city of Cape Girardeau. Thanks, Chuck. I really appreciate that. Um, and just maybe to follow up a little bit, um, you know, John Maynard has been around for the city for quite a long time, so he's seen a lot of changes as well. Um, really? <laughs> he's got some wisdom and experience in all this business aspect of parks and recreation, but. Uh, I think it kind of boils down a little bit too to quality of life and from a chamber perspective, um, give us kind of that feel of what it means to be in a community that does value parks and recreation. I will and it's, it's, it's huge in becoming bigger all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me say with what we do we focus in the business world on two things, retention and then we also focus on recruiting or, or expanding. From a retention standpoint, it's extremely important for the businesses in this area to be able to retain a quality workforce. And what Parks Rec and those opportunities provide is huge in the quality of life aspect of keeping people in an area. You know, when the economy begins, and it is now, begins to get better, and when the economy is good, people have choices. And when people have choices, they can choose much better where to locate, and they choose places that have options and that are rewarding. We are blessed here to have a system that addresses young people, old people, and those of us kind of in between, leaning toward the old side. <laughs> Our system addresses married, it addresses single, it addresses with kids, without kids. We have opportunities here for, for all of that, and that's huge. On a recruitment standpoint, um, Companies, corporations, uh, medical facilities, even existing businesses recruiting people into this area, it is extremely important to have a whole bunch of things that you can offer, okay? People want to know, you know, can they go watch athletics if they want to, and luckily we have a university. They want to know what our park system looks like and what the opportunities here for that. They want to know if we have the arts, and they, they want to know all of those different things. And everything that you can assemble as part of that is huge for selling your area. And again, here locally, there are some that say we have a whole lot of park ground compared to areas our size. I will tell you that even if we do, it's a selling point for us. And it's, it's huge, it's huge what we offer. When you roll out your circular that shows all the things that you guys offer, things put together, those are all selling points that help us in that area. So from that standpoint, it's huge. I want to take a second and say something else to the people that work in this industry because, and I'm going to go personal here for a minute, and I apologize because I've become a lot more soft-hearted in my old age, so I'll try to do this without crying. He has two sons that just went off to college. I have three sons total, two that just graduated and went away, so I'm also an empty nester right now for the first time, but I told you that I coached a lot. I want you all to know this, that work in this business. For years, I, I coached baseball for, for all of my kids. And sometimes in my job, because I deal with people all of the time, and I love people, don't get me wrong, it's what drives me, but sometimes I have to go be where there aren't people. And so sometimes, and I just said this to Scott the other day when we were riding around, sometimes when I get a lunch that I don't have a meeting for, I'll go and grab something and, and I will go to a park, but I will go to a diamond 
in a park mm -hmm. where I coached. And I will go through memories that I have at that diamond. And it's everything from the guy that was out there dragging that diamond because it had rained or getting it prepared to what my kids did on that diamond, to what his sons did on that diamond, to what the tons of other sons that I coached did on that diamond that I still know in that community. And that's a huge stress reliever and re-energizer for me. So for all the people that work all the little details mm -hmm. that you may think people don't notice, mm -hmm. they notice. <coughs> and I appreciate it. All right, so Sorry. you're making me get a turn I know. <laughs> Notice I did good. I didn't you know. Good and then yeah. there's the debate whether that outweighs Chuck's economic impact. I mean, <laughs> seriously, you got an intangible, it's tangible thing going on here, and I think they're both it's huge. huge. Yeah. It's and really fortunately, good. Unfortunately, though, you have both. Right. That's yeah. True. I mean, yeah. so we don't have to choose and count. Yeah. We have both. That's yeah, right. I agree. Well, I want to capitalize on something that uh, John said, not the one that made me cry, because I'd probably, I probably. You, you hit it right on the head of the intangible aspect of we create memories. We build memories. Every single opportunity that we can interact positively um, with our public and in the environment um, is a memory maker and a memory anchor uh, for people. And so I appreciate you sharing that personal story. Um, but John, you also brought up the collaborative aspects of our business. Um, we're a, kind of a piece of that pie, but we're blessed that we live in a town that uh, is, has very strong commitment to community overall. Uh, we are in a college town. Uh, which is a huge dynamic for us. We're a regional medical hub among many, many other things. So it's kind of a unique uh, environment here in Cape Girardeau. But when we talk about parks and recreation, it's not just the parks and recreation department for the city. It's really the quality of life aspects that we all bring to the table, the university with the art and culture and the sports and the many other nonprofit organizations that host special events from you know, United Way to many of our churches and many of the groups that we all come together. Recently, we had an opportunity to, as a city staff and a leadership team, to bring up a kind of a new, uh, I guess, mantra for us, and it's called, We Are One Cape. We Are One Cape. And under the leadership of Scott Meyer, our city manager, he has a vision that we all, it's not just parks and recreation, it's not just public works, it's not just the chamber, it's not just the university. Sure, we all know and love our own areas that we work in best, but it's bigger than that. We are all bigger than that, and it's in achieving that collaboration can we truly work towards greatness and making our city even better. So at this point in time, I get to turn it over to my boss, uh, Scott Meyer, to maybe elaborate a little bit, but then also tell us about your challenges, because as a city manager, um, you have many, many bosses. And if anybody has ever had elected officials as their boss, um, you can really appreciate um, the, just the, and we have seven elected officials, which is a, quite a lot of <coughs> for a city our size. So Scott, tell us a little bit about your challenges as city manager, and maybe as it relates to also you know, Parks and Rec and the balance that you have to achieve with all your other departments. Well, I, uh, I do appreciate that. And I think that, uh, I think We Are One Cape is extremely appropriate. And um, I think as we, as we look to the future, and it's been uh, alluded to already quite a bit, um, we can't be isolationists anymore. We cannot, we cannot afford that. It's unhealthy. I mean, all sorts, you know, there's all sorts of, of research to, to talk about that. But we do have these machines that tend to do that as well. But, but we really have to approach this holistically, and it's holistically in a lot of different ways. It is the whole city. It's the whole person. As, as we, we try to interact with people, we, don't, we, we have to interact with the whole person anymore. And so we can't just be Parks and Rec. We have to understand that Parks and Rec affects crime. Do we think of that very often? No, we really don't. But we have to in the future. We've got to begin to, to think of it holistically because there's going to be stress on, on tax dollars. No question about it. There's going to be extreme stress on tax, tax dollars going forward. People are going to ask those questions. They're going to say, how come I want to spend money on parks and recs when I, when I, when I, when I'm, I worry about the police? Um, but, but they aren't isolated. And I think that's part of the story that we need to tell as a city 
is that the health of our community uh, in so many ways is affected by, by parks and rec and police and fire and public works. Your fresh, you know, clean water and, uh, and clean uh, uh, disposal of your water uh, and a clean trash system is incredibly important to your health. And so I think if we begin to step back and look at it holistically, I think it, it really is important. And I think that's what we're trying to do with our tangible results in, in looking at what are our outcomes and how they, how they go uh, between departments. And, um, and so that's, that's one of the big challenges that I see. The other big one is the whole government. And this is a, this is a big threat to all of us. Um, there is um, an anti-government sentiment that is, that is uh, in our country. Uh, and if we are not careful, we will be part of that. And, and, and if we become part of that, if that poisons us, then it will greatly impact our ability to, to deal with the whole person, the whole community. And, and that's, that's really sad because local is where it's at. <laughs> And people talk about local food, local food and local, um, uh, buy local and how important that is. Well, local government is where it's at. If you look at what actually affects your day-to-day -day life, it's water, it's sewer, it's trash, it's recreation, it's security, it's police, it's fire. It's all those things together uh, is the impact of that is, is tremendous on people's daily lives. And yet we can get caught up in the whole big picture and lose that and we can't allow that to be lost and so uh, our, our message of uh, we are one cape and and we want to, to look at things holistically is about is about the whole person and it's about local and it's about healthier better living and it leads to stories just like John told me. Scott thank you so much and I think that uh, we work so hard in uh, the city to uh, keep, be transparent, to establish and keep the public trust. I think that's one of the things that, you know, hopefully uh, in Cape Girardeau, uh, we always want to be able to hold up that we're accountable, we're responsible with the public tax dollar, uh, that we do a good job in helping our public understand where their funds go and they've rewarded us and recognized us for that. And we cannot lose that. We cannot lose that as public servants, and we cannot lose that as our key responsibility uh, back to the city. So I had some questions here uh, that I would just topically ask, but I think it might be more engaging if we uh, turn to the audience and ask the audience if they had any questions of uh, any of our officials. And, um, we'd love to hear uh, from you, and you can select one or all of our panels for any of your questions. So, anybody want to be brave enough to throw one out there? Any of our students? Okay. No? Penny, you've got to have a question. Covered it all. <laughs> all right, well, I have some. Just in case. <laughs> Always be prepared, right? Um, so here's one of the strange, not strange, but difficult ones that we face as a Parks and Recreation Department, and I think as a community. Um, a big topic over the last uh, couple of years, obviously, has been health care and health care services, and especially for maybe the disadvantaged and the underserved. Something that we deal with on a regular basis is how can we improve our community health? Um, so what I'd like maybe for some of the panel to think about and, and, and bring up as a response is um, at all levels of government we deal with this, but how do you feel that Parks and Recreation helps address some of these issues with health um, and improving um, the opportunities for our underserved? <laughs> Anybody can jump in, Jan? Well, the, there's a poem that is quite long, and so I will not recite it, but it's called um, The Ambulance Down in the Valley. And it describes a hazardous stretch of road where cars keep coming around a curve, and they go off the curve and they fall off, and then they have to go down. And so this town has to decide, do we want to put a fence up on the road, or we put an ambulance in the valley? 
And the story is that of prevention rather than intervention or treatment in this case. And that's where I think we have a, a concerted role is because you know the statistics prove that a, that if you, a, a person is engaged in healthy physical activity as a young person, they're much more likely to stay at it. And then there's some critical points. About age 11 is when things drop off, so that's where a lot of Parks and Rec emphasizes their their um, uh, activities and, and uh, energy uh, towards when some people drop off in sports and physical activity. And it's the idea that if you if you do it at the front end, you're much less likely to deal with problems on the on the in the rear end. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> and, I, and I know of what something I speak. like that. So um, it's it's the idea that we are in a good place to offer preventive um, strategies so that people don't get sick and end up costing you know, their own health, their family's health, their livelihood, employers' insurance coverage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down. You know, Jan, I think you do bring up a good point because I think access and location, the more people within your community that have access to resources um, helps build the strength and the weakest links in your community. And I think that's one of the things that we take a look at is how are we developing and growing as a city, and where are our weakest areas that we need to help uh, build up and support? And so I think one of the city's uh, most recent uh, initiatives is our neighborhood improvement uh, initiative in several of our communities where we're actually trying to improve uh, the, their own leadership efforts within their community, but also access uh, to resources. So we'll have to, we'll come back and see how that turns Definitely. out. I was just going to follow up and, and basically say I think it comes back to something that Scott addressed earlier and that is the fact that um, look at what is happening at your local level and the fact is that we do have a very good community, um, one that we can be very proud of. Um, I certainly will not get into politics but I would definitely say to you regardless of your political leanings, not every tax is a bad tax. Um, the fact is that when you look at what was able to be accomplished with the parks and stormwater tax, um, from my perspective as a CBB, you take a look at Cape Splash, which has indeed brought in re people from across the region um, that have been able to take advantage of that. But in addressing this very question of disadvantaged, if you will, um, also something that was built was the community center at the Shawnee Sports Complex. Um, providing an outlet for uh, folks in South Cape as well. So I think that uh, there has been an overall emphasis of really addressing a variety of needs, things that are going to benefit us from bringing economic impact to the community, but also being cognizant of the needs of those who are indeed disadvantaged. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you just don't know the quality of life and the change that person's going to have through those opportunities. I mean, this could be a deal breaker for some of these folks, for all of us, for all of us. So. Julia, I've got a question for Jan. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Joe, right? Yeah. So Joe touched on something earlier, and by the way, I went to Mizzou as well, so MIC. <laughs> uh, Joe touched on something earlier. He said, you know, at, at CMO here, Kids don't know about parks and recreation until students don't know about it until they get there. So, um, you know, my story about parks and rec is kind of always a buddy of mine went out to San Francisco to do his internship after, and not with parks and rec, but just in general. And he said, Nobody's from here. He said, The, the common question that everybody asks is, Where are you from? Because mm. nobody's from San Francisco, right? Everybody moves into San Francisco. And so it was, it's something that always struck me about parks and rec is, as a parks and rec major, everybody asks, Well, you know, what was, what did you start, what was your major start? <laughs> because, <laughs> it, because it's true, it's just, nobody knows about that going in. Just like Joe said, everybody, you know, has dreams of, or dreams or aspirations, or they're just pushed into something that, you know, you, you should be a doctor, you should be an engineer. I actually started as an engineering major. Um, so, you know, you, you know, you're pushed into these things that seem great because, you know, they're going to pay you a bunch of money or, or, or whatever the case may be. And then, um, you know, you get into college, and for me, it was just an eye-opening experience to say, I don't really want to be an engineer for the rest of my life. It's not what I want to do. And so I ended up going into Parks and Rec because I worked at, uh, at the rec center on campus there, and I realized that the people that were, that were my bosses, that's what they went into, and that's what they did. 
do. And so I'm just curious um, if that's something that NPRA or nationally, if that's something um, education-wise in the high school, what ranks uh, of getting that out there? I, you know, I should have brought cash money for you <laughs> <laughs> because you weren't a plant, but how wonderful. Um, as you all can probably tell, I mean, I could talk for days and days and days, and, I, and I'm, I'm so grateful for your indulgence for, for my going on and on. But one of, the, one of our goals for the next step in our public awareness, repositioning, whatever you want to call it, this education, the what, so what, now what campaign that we've been going on and now that we're giving, <coughs> we're literally giving around the country, people are bringing us to speak about this, that's what we were doing in Kentucky, mm. is, is our, one of our next goals is to bring our students, and we, we call you our students, because we know because I was the same thing, secondary English education, that's what I was going to do because that's what I was good at and I'm going to do something I'm good at. And then I went and spent a week in an, in an English classroom in secondary, no way. I am not babysitting all day long. <laughs> and this was a long time ago. So I was lucky enough, had a professor from Mizzou who went to my church, talked blah, 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 and, and I ended up changing majors. Changed my life. And that brings me to, we change people's lives. And every time you ask someone, you were talking about the memories. Every time you ask, I don't know how many of you ask your kids, what are, what are your most, your richest memories of your growing up? It's not sitting in school, it's not sitting in church, it's probably not doing chores or anything like that. What is it? Going camping. It's, it's vacations, it's camping, it's sports, it's activities. We are the, the memories that are embedded in how many, how many hours, days, years do we spend in school, and yet that's not what comes up. We can do that for the next generation. And maybe our role is in high school. And I really appreciated your comment that you're actually steered away, and I don't know if they say bad things about Parks and Rec, but saying that you can't make a living in Parks and Rec, please, that's just, that's just not right. We need to talk to those guidance counselors or something. So, so we want to, in, we want to um, do some curriculum content at the college level, but your comment and yours too, maybe that's not, maybe we need to go to the high school level. Maybe we need to be there at those job fairs or career fairs or college fairs. And I don't know if CMO does that, you know, goes to. Yeah, we do, we do some of it, but we, and I've got. We do what we can. Yeah, I've gotten a little bit involved, but yeah, that, I do. And think maybe that, we can help. Oh yeah, with that. there needs with to be that, a more our, concerted all effort. Of our I agree. Programs. So I agree. thank you. I, uh, I see that. And I know our it's, department, in fact, almost everybody here has participated in one of the local uh, high school uh, job fairs. Sure. And here's what I'm going to do, because for the sake of time, we do have students that have class, we have teachers that need to get back, uh, we have business leaders that need to, to finish up with their busy schedule. So I'd like to wrap it up maybe with one or two more questions from the audience, and then we'll go around and uh, ask the panel to just provide some closing comments. And so I think, Scott, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I just had one comment for everybody, to, not to put you on the spot, but Parks and Recreation has been defined as very important in Cape Girardeau and the region. And in 2008, when Danny helped lead the campaign to pass the PRS um, one tax, Bob and I, we went around the community and got different leaders who we knew, knew would be great faces to sell our proposal. We had kids in our video, we had business leaders, we had small business leaders. Bob Neff had one of the best quotes in the, Bob Neff's a local um, car dealer in town, big car dealer in town, and his wife were very supportive of our programs. Bob said that um, communities are either moving forward or they're moving backward. I think that was one of the most key key quotes. And there's a lot of communities around here that have kind of become stagnant. People are jealous of Cape, but we're always moving forward. What will Southeast faculty and the city manager and the leadership and the chamber do? What will the students do? What will you do to prepare students to become part of our staff? We've got a big not to not to knock off Heather or Brian down there, but how many are Southeast majors? So we got a pretty good, pretty good trend. What will we do to continue to develop them in recreation and sports management? And Scott, what will the city do to help continue to help fund us? We're, we may not be police and fire, but we are a big economic force that brings in sales tax. What will support will we get? John, sponsorships, reaching out to the community business leaders. We ask more and more and compete with everybody to get sponsorships. What can you guys do to get more sponsorships and help encourage them to be, become sponsors? Jan, what statistics can you give us? going into 2018, I think, renewal. 
what's the percentages of people that have re renewed with success and what's some things that have gone bad or not bad. Chuck, what what can we do to continue to get funding and help develop? I know we're working on these. What can we what can CBB bring us to help us keep developing and bringing in new uh, sports business? And Joe, what can you do to help encourage other students to get involved as a freshman or sophomore? So we're not there's some students we don't see for four years. And then that's not a good model. What can you do to enforce to get people out in our jobs? So just a look real quick. What did Scott just put a throw down to? Uh, okay. guys, so How much time we got here? Should we order pizza? <laughs> just why, 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 don't we, pizza? why don't we start with Tom? Maybe incorporate that into some of your closing comments and then we'll finish up with our, our uh, young student here and hear his words of wisdom. Well, Go ahead, Tom. I was going to say the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, Scott, you've, you've always good at shaking things up, and I, I love it. You always get my, my wheels turning, so I love what you just threw down on us. Um, I love this idea of moving forward, um, and, 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 um, and I see the program at Southeast Missouri State University in, in recreation and, and recreation parks administration. Uh, we actually just changed our name and tweaked our program a little bit. So we're, we're designing some things, but I believe in a very, we have got to collaborate. And I think you talked about this whole cake, the one cake thing. Let's quit, let's quit our little turf wars and our little things and let's, we got to come together. And if we're going to move forward, we've got to continue to see that and move forward. And I mean, I'm excited about some collaborative things and, and working together and plugging in. I mean, you all are the ones, I mean, I can get up there and talk about theory and talk till I'm blue in the face, but until you get in the trenches and do stuff with you folks and do practical experiences and internships and stuff, and I just, I want to continue to develop this thing. And I've got folks out here that help me do mock interviews and we come down here and plug practicum students and internships and I mean <laughs> there's just a lot going on I want to continue that and I, I see this as a, a very good symbiotic relationship where you help me and I help you and this is this is a great thing and I, I just want to full force move forward in that direction and keep the keep the thing going there and it, it's just I think it's about being intentional for me and, and all of us and keeping that Keeping that in the wheelhouse and being intentional, that's, that's really what it takes. But I agree, uh, we got to do that. And, and when it happens, it's just awesome. You know, and we've got folks, we've got several folks that came out of, just recently have come out of our program and working here full time. And it's just, it's just awesome. And, uh, and it starts small. And it starts with those little steps forward. And, and I think so, several folks have said it well. Uh, you know, it's taking those small steps and taking that initiative and, you know, I could, I can't do it for them, but when they start that, those steps and they get in here, they're just like, this is, and then they start to get more and more experience and then the next thing opens and the next thing's open and the next thing's open and the next, but it's those, getting them to have that epiphany to do that, but I, I, I I'm all in, I'm all in, let's go, I drank the Kool-Aid. So let's do it. Tom, that sounds like a big hoorah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Scott. Well, what am I going to do? Um, you know, as the city moves forward, we, we, are, we are about moving forward. We are the regional hub for Southeast Missouri. We, we've declared that. We, 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 that is our territory. And to remain the regional hub, to continue to be the regional hub, we've got to move forward. We can't be static. And so I think it's a great quote. Uh, that, that you pull out with, with Bob Neff. I think though that the, that the other thing that we will have to do is we will have to see our commitment. People, people will buy in to Scott Williams much quicker than they'll buy into Scott Meyer. Why? Because you have this personal relationship that you've built with them that you've shown them given their trust what you will do for them in the area of parks right? and that is powerful. And that is spread not just with you all, but the people that you brought on, that you're mentoring. And as that continues, I think that that, that is what will, will be in the balance in 2018. And I think it will, the balance will be, will be won. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so it'll take the right program. It'll take the right things. <coughs> but ultimately, when it comes to government, it's going to be much more personal. And that's what I tried to talk about earlier. It's, if, if you say... Do you want to give the government more money or continue to give them money or not? 
Yeah. People's first reaction is no. But if you make it personal, and you say, what is it going to be? And it's going to, and, and this is what our professionals recommend, and here's why, and here's why it's going to make a difference in your whole life, in the whole life of the city, mm -hmm. and it's going to be controlled locally, don't buy it. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. I'm, I will stand beside you, but I, but, but, but again, I will not lead a successful effort if this is a Scott Myers program. It will not, it will fail. But if it is you, you'll be successful. I agree. And I think that another point there, too, is convincing everybody. And somebody talked about this whole thing. They, they can't say what it is. And getting everybody to, to I, I remember several of my friends when this thing passed, it's like, why do I, I don't go use those parks. I don't go do this stuff. I don't do, why do I, why do I need to pay more taxes to do this stuff? And I'm just like, listen, everybody wins, dude. Do you like eating a burger at that restaurant? Do you like going into that convenience store and filling up your gas tank right next to your house? Those places are going to fold up if this doesn't pass, you know, and they can't see the big picture. And it's trying to get them to understand that we're all in this together. And yeah, you may not go walk this LaCroix, Cape LaCroix Trail, but dang it, this, we need to enhance this stuff and keep us all float, like you were talking about the, the money behind it. So. Thank you, Tom. I also think a lot of people that said they would never walk the Cape Croix Trail have walked it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Before we get to John, please, uh, question. You know, I will say, just you know, Scott, just to what you said, about. Um, the, the tax and, and everything. They just, if you guys listened to Fawn Riggins' show um, two weeks ago prior to us passing the fire tax, um, there, she was interviewing somebody that was, you know, in the no campaign. No mold taxes, you know. And I, and I will say, um, one comment that she made was when they were talking about, they, it, eventually the conversation came back to government and, you know, more taxes and all this. We all owe Fawn Regan a uh, <coughs> thank you, because what she did was she said, no, I think our city government does a great job. And she said, you talked about taxes, but eventually the conversation got back around to parks and recreation. And she said, I think they're good stewards of our money. Mm -hmm. She said, and, and it all got back to the park tax and, and the facilities that we built and, and the things that we do. So this community is fortunate that we have set a good example. Mm -hmm. And we have done some very good things. So. Um, congratulations, we're happy. The Parks and Recreation Department is happy that the fire tax passed. And we only see good things coming. We've got to keep that momentum going. So um, I do think, as far as government goes, we, we have done a good job. And, we and, have been good and, why, and why is that? Because, because personally, she's been touched by it. Personally, she's experienced the Special Olympics. She's, she is invested in that. And, so, so, and, she's, and she sees that you're, invest, you're vested in that. That's what her experience is that she says, she says, I, you know, they spend their money wisely. She, what she has seen, people don't see all of city government. They see what they're exposed to. And so the, the, the little lady that I talked to who's, who's, who the fireman came out and, and, and broke through the, the oh, widened the door to get her husband out, that was her experience. And, and it was important to her. And, and that's what I said, these, these professionals that do their job, that in, in a lot of ways, if you start shining the light off them, the first thing they do is deflect the attention and say, oh, it's, it's, it's not me, it's people who work for me. Those people are the ones that make the difference. And, and, and you're right, Fawn you know, had a forum and she could have gone either way. She could have, she could have piled on and said, yeah, that you know, government's bad. But she didn't because she had a different personal experience that was put on by you all. And that's what made the difference. Thanks, Scott. John? Mine's simple and brief. Um, I may get some argument in the room, but I have the greatest job in the world. <laughs> and the reason I have the greatest job in the world is because I get to work for people like two names that you guys mentioned today. Dan Hessner, sitting next to you. Bob Neff, who you talked about as part of the campaign. I get to work for local people who get it. And those are the folks that are behind these kinds of efforts. Those are the folks that really understand what it takes to keep us and move us forward in the position that we're in. And so I see that partnership doing nothing but continuing and getting stronger and stronger. So we look forward to it. And I thank Danny, and I'll yell up real loud so Bob can hear me up on the hill. 
By the way, I always thought you should take the next slide and start at the roof of his dealership and go all the way down into the... <laughs> <laughs> that's, about, that's about going to happen. Actually. And I want to say thank you to you real quick um, because I had no idea what I was going to offer on this when you said come and I saw the list and saw the questions and thought, you know what, I can talk about this. So I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, and you play a, a key role. Uh, Jan. I know she's kind of afraid you don't want to talk about this. <laughs> okay, she can talk on my Okay, I, I will try to keep it simple. First of all, I have a couple of challenges um, that I am motivated to present to you. Um, first of all, I think that the model that I have heard here today, and I have no idea what kind of conversations take place behind closed doors, if it's all holding hands and kumbaya. <clears throat> but this is the model that I believe, and it's a belief, it's a heart belief, um, should be emulated, not just in Missouri, but you know, around the world, um, to where people understand that we're all different for a reason, and we all work together. It is about the whole person, and we do need to work together. And um, I would challenge a couple of things. First of all, I would love to invite any of you or some more people to address our conference at um, one of our education sessions. Uh, perhaps a, a highlighted session, because um, I believe you are setting an example. For example, to have a chamber person here talking in support of a tax is kind of a rare thing. <laughs> and I don't know if you were in support of the tax in public oh, yes. in 2008, but that is a rare thing. Um, I also would like to challenge the campus at SEMO. Um, I have only been with uh, MPRA seven years. I haven't had a lot of interaction with SEMO, and there's geographic challenges, and that's I, I bear at least part of that responsibility for not making that connection. But I'd like to get to know you all better. I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to pick your brain. You are a member of our southeast region, which fortunately or unfortunately includes St. Louis. and starts, you know, at St. Louis and comes all the way down here. And I, I believe that Cape Girardeau could be a leader in that region, regardless of the millions of people that St. Louis have and the lots of funding and that kind of thing. And I don't like to challenge you to be a visible part of our Southeast region. So um, please consider doing that. And that SEMO could become the flagship university accredited program for that entire region. Um, so I'd like to see more of you and hear more of you for that. And just to thank you once again for recognizing the importance of doing this kind of discussion. And uh, we may change some, we actually may change some lives here. And I know I'll be thinking differently. Beck, you'll have to listen to me all the way to Papa Bluff. And um, thank you, Julia, yes, very much for everything. Jan, thank you so much. We accept your challenge. <laughs> and we will work, uh, we will enjoy working together towards that. But Chuck, some last thoughts. In regard to what Scott asked, Jan can verify that um, on my pre-written notes here, one of the things that I have written down, Scott, was that it is critical for parks and the CBD to continue to work together. Um, you know, we need to be able to ensure that future fields, um, uh, <coughs> if an indoor sports complex comes about, to make sure that the design is going to meet state, regional groups, so that we're able to bring in those groups that are going to bring in even more money to the community to avoid scheduling conflicts. Obviously, we have to be out there talking with groups only after we've had a chance to talk with you and your folks to make sure that it's going to fit. And then to really target those groups that we can provide an excellent experience to so that, uh, again, that we have those future uh, coming back. So from a CBP perspective, um, the relationship that we have, I would hope that we can only continue to work and enhance that in the future. Chuck, thank you so much for bringing that up. And for many of you that may not uh, realize, uh, we had a recent um, committee decision that is going to be recommended to our city council that with our restaurant tax, which had um, uh, funded a lot of our uh, quality of life facilities, uh, continue on through 2030. And the current recommendation is to build a new uh, indoor or to establish a new indoor um, sports venue, fairly large. It could be upwards of about 100,000 square feet with a multitude of sports being able to be hosted and make primarily during the winter months when we can drive tourism and business during those slower performing 
uh, tax or um, hotel funds. So we're excited to see where that goes, and that'll be a really exciting opportunity for us to even uh, work more closely together. All right, well, that brings us to Joe. Joe, you get to bring us home and your <laughs> philosophical thoughts and wisdom about parks and recreation for the future. No yeah. Uh, <laughs> in response to Scott's question of like what students like myself can do to help fuel this recreation movement, um, so I've been hit on that um, students going into universities, like whether it be from a directly from a high school or from a community college, they have to face whether their uh, their career is geared towards making the most money or following their passion. That's kind of what I had to deal with. Um, we have to, as students, we have to kind of um, recruit the younger, whether it be the you know, freshman, sophomore, or um, juniors and seniors in high school. We kind of have to show them that there is um, more powerful rewards in following something you're passionate about, and, uh, and that um, there's just other tangible ways to measure success besides just money and prestige. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot to be offered. In, uh, the form of rec, because uh, as uh, John, right? Yes. You know, there's so many memories that come from things recreational, be vacations or uh, or hiking. You know, just just going on walks with the grandparents in the woods or whatever it is, something from our childhood. Um, you know, those things can be as as important or more than than things like money. Um, or that's just that's just it. The two things we have in common, or one thing we have in common, we both went to Shawnee Community College, and people, my guidance counselor in high school thought I shouldn't even go to college, so <laughs> you can't achieve a lot. I mean, you can start a small school and move to a big school or a mid-sized school and achieve a lot of levels in this field. You can have finances that are, that are good, and you can have experiences and things that you internally um, believe in to make, make the job very good, which is a part of why all these guys do what they do. Well, that's why we tell them they should remember. Impact is a big part of what we do. We don't have impact, we, we, we shouldn't be in this field. The other thing you said about families, I can tell you, you can raise a family. Penny and I raised two kids in this family. This, this is my kid's extended family. And not to quote Hillary, but they have been raised by a village. Not only these 12 people, but probably 150 different part-time people over the year. There's no greater way to raise kids than around this field. And they're both, very outgoing, both good students, both great athletes, and that's why a large portion because of these people. They had to grow. They grew up in this gymnasium. They grew up at the arena. And they grew up around these people. So um, it is a good field to go to. So don't worry about being family. <laughs> Families, it's a great place to raise a family. Thank you for that, Scott Penny. Um, and I, I do. Want, I have a message for the students, though. And Jan, um, you know, I applied for an internship whenever I was a student at Southeast. I thought, what am I going to do with my career? And um, I want the best internship in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I thought in my mind, what can I do? And so I applied for an internship with PRA. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just to put the connection together, when in your mind you want to do, I knew I was going to stay in Missouri because I love Missouri. My hometown is Perryville, Missouri. Uh, so I thought, well, what can I do in this state that, that would be the best internship, the best experience? And so I applied for MPRA. And so when you think that, that they're the big MPRA, you know, the best, the association, know that they accepted me. And I went up there and I did, I did an internship for Dave Oslin, who, you know, yeah. And so um, it was an awesome experience. And I encourage you, don't think because we're Southeast Missouri that we can't get to the Columbias or to Jeff Cities or those type things. And that's where I, I developed a relationship with, with MPRA and with um, Jefferson City Parks and Recreation. And then I worked for State Parks. I did an internship for State Parks whenever I was up there because David said, while you're up here, let's do everything that you can possibly do. So I worked half days at MPRA and half days for um, Missouri State Parks. And so um, I just encourage you to reach out and, and take that step and do those kinds of things because it's those things that are going to make us work together. So. It's that kind of attitude. I want the best internship, you know, and it takes those steps. You know, Joe drove over here from uh, Jonesboro, Anna, uh, to be here with us this morning. Didn't have any classes or any real reason to be here in Cape. You know, he commutes. Dropped out of high school. I'm telling a little story on it. <laughs> dropped out of high school. You think, what? You dropped... He and his wife came into my office and started talking to me about rec this summer. And he and his wife, Jesse, we were chit-chatting, chit and he goes, yeah, 
we just dropped out of high school and got our uh, G GEDs and started community college. And, and I was like, that's awesome! And, and Jess looks at me and goes, that's weird. Most people would say, you did what? Yes, you know? But I just think, you know, they, they could see where they wanted to go and they're going that direction. It's the kind of student that, and getting that mentality and, and giving them those kind of things and now finish that up and jumping into this program and getting that knocked out and moving ahead. And, and I agree, it's that kind of mentality. And how do we get that, where does that start? Where do we get that going and how do we send those folks in the direction? But those are the people shaking it up. Well, and we don't always follow the same path right. you know, to get right. there. And I think we have to acknowledge that um, Parks and Rec provides that avenue. Um, we're definitely a nurturing ground uh, for people that um, not only are looking to find their passion, but then once they find it, there's so much variety yeah. and so much excitement yeah. in our field and so much diversity. Um, so that's what we talk about a lot in our classes, that there's just um, so many opportunities in parks and recreation. And I'd like to um, close our session uh, this morning by thanking uh, Jessica Sexton, our public information officer, for doing our videotaping uh, today. She's got a big job uh, ahead of her. I'm not sure how she's going to edit all this exciting information. <laughs> Can't edit out one single piece. I want to thank all of our staff who worked really, really hard uh, last night, all day yesterday, and the last couple days gave up their Veterans Day holiday to come in and, and make spaghetti for us. And so thank you so much for showing up uh, early this morning. And all the folks that, uh, all the kids that came from class and our students and our professors and our business folks, and especially uh, Jan and our panel, um, you all are very, very busy and important people, and we're just glad that you spent uh, this time uh, with us. I think we truly made a case this morning that Parks and Recreation does build community, but more importantly, we build memories. And I just want to thank you all for being here. So let's give our panel a big round of applause.